Cardassians a little bit. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it pretty basic. And then maybe at the end, I'll do some hand waving in order to explain some of uh, Michael's ideas in the last paper. But that would get very technical. So we won't dwell too much on that. It was, of course, as, as usual, very beautiful, everything that he did. OK, so we want to talk about directed Laplacians. OK, but that's not really where this uh, story begins. It begins with undirected Laplacians. So let's first uh, hear about those. So they're defined in terms of a graph G, undirected graph, with vertices V, edges E, uh, and edge weights W. W assigns a positive weight to every edge. Let's say that there are N vertices, M edges. OK, and then let's define the adjacency matrix of the graph. I think you all know what it looks like, but let me say it anyway. So the adjacency matrix A lives in Rn by n. And it's given by the Aij entry is just the weight on edge ij, or 0 if no edge. OK. And then we're dealing with an undirected graph. So we're going to say that this is equal to Wji. The weight is the same in both directions. So this means that it's a symmetric matrix. Now, the, let's define another matrix, the degree matrix. Degree matrix D. This is a diagonal matrix. It lives in Rn by n as well. Diagonal. And it just has, as you can guess, dii. The ith entry is the degree in the weighted sense of vertex i. So it's the sum over j incident that share an edge with i, the weight of edge ij. OK, so then the Laplacian of this uh, undirected graph is the Laplacian l is just d minus a. And this turns out to be a really useful matrix. And part of why it's useful is that we're really good at analyzing it. So uh, Spielman and Tang showed in 2004 that you can solve uh, equations Lx equals b. So that is given L and b, we want to find x. You can solve this to high accuracy in time O tilde m, and it works with high probability. So we get an approximate solution x, but it, to x, it's very highly accurate, though. And we get it really quickly in nearly linear time. It works with high probability. Is this useful? It's very useful. It's had lots of applications. I don't really have time to write them all out, because I don't write that fast. But it's things like uh, computing electrical flows. That's the very classical application. Uh, at least in theoretical computer science, or analyzing random walks in undirected graphs. Let me write that. So, so this was just one example, analyzing random walks in undirected graphs. OK, and they also get used for things like computing maximum flows, really good things to be able to solve linear equations in. Uh, OK, so that's been a really big topic in theoretical computer science. Now let's talk about directed Laplacians and why they might be interesting. So directed Laplacian is defined in terms of a digraph G, so directed graph, still with vertices V, edges, which are now directed, and edge weights. And it's a positive weight for every edge still, and vertices, M edges, and adjacency matrix. Uh, and then we say that we have this Aij is the weight on edge ij. But now we don't require that it's symmetric anymore. So it's not a symmetric matrix, the adjacency matrix. We still define a degree matrix, but let me now emphasize that it's the out degree matrix. So it's the matrix of out degrees. So dii, we want to sum over j such that there is an edge 2j from i. And then we get the weight here 
weight to j from i. Okay, uh, another way of saying that is that d i i is equal to the ith entry of one transpose a. So we look at the column sum. That's the degree, the out degree. And then we still define now the directed Laplacian, which is d minus a. OK. Do we get fast solvers? The answer is yes. We get the same thing. Uh, this is due to Michael, John Kellner, myself, uh, Peoples, Peng, Sidford, and Rao. And it's not published yet, but should be on archive soon. So we get a solver that runs in nearly linear time. It's high accuracy and it works with high probability. It's the same kind of thing. But the main thing that we know to use it for is that it's good for analyzing directed random walks. So now we get things like we can compute the stable distribution of a random walk in nearly linear time in the number of entries of the matrix. Until Michael got involved and started working on this, the running time was just n power omega omega being the matrix multiplication constant, which is about 2.37. OK, but then in a sequence of works, it got down to nearly linear. So big improvement, problem that had been open for a very long time. But this is just you know, the latest thing. Really, most of the work was done in earlier things that did not involve me. So Michael, Kellner, Peng, Peoples, Sidford and Vladu in 2016 gave the first really kind of breakthrough progress on this. They showed uh, an algorithm for the same problem. And the time was, so again, solving linear equations in directed Laplacians. The time was m power 4 thirds n plus m power 2, th no, sorry, n times m power 2 thirds. OK, and then. Later, the same group plus Anup Rao, also in 2016, they got the running time down to what's called almost linear. <laughs> Not nearly linear, but almost linear. Uh, so this is O tilde, this should also have a tilde, uh, m exp order square root log n. OK, this x square root log n grows slower than any polynomial. So it's better than m power 1 plus epsilon for any epsilon. But it's worse than m poly log n for any poly log. Okay? And then it eventually got down to poly log over here. Now, the key idea up here was to reduce solving uh, directed Laplacians, so linear equations in these, to uh, solving a few, so we need a few more systems, a few Eulerian Laplacians, which are a special kind of directed Laplacians, but easier to work with. So we change it to a different kind of linear system, which I'll tell you much more about. Uh, but then we need to solve a few of these. Okay. But these Eulerian Laplacians, we'll get familiar with them, and we'll see that they behave in, like undirected Laplacians in certain ways, which turn out to be very useful. OK, so that was the key step here. Reduce it to a, a much nicer case. The key step here, well, there were really two key ideas. Uh, the first one was to develop sparsification of these Eulerian Laplacians. Sparsification of Eulerian Laplacians. How many people are familiar with sparsification of undirected graphs? Raise your hand if. OK, good, good. So, OK, so the same works for Eulerian Laplacians. If you get a dense Eulerian Laplacian, you can approximate it with another Eulerian Laplacian that has n log n edges, OK, and in a very useful kind of way. However, uh, it doesn't work for general directed Laplacians. So, it's really important that we have this reduction to Eulerian. OK, the second key thing was to then combine this sparsification with the squaring 
Laplacian solver of uh, Peng Spielman from 2014, I think. Uh, and this, I say combined, it gets very messy. There's very complicated recursions that you really need like Richard Peng or Michael Cohen for. So um, later we then kind of got rid of all the complicated recursion and we instead built an algorithm based on the approximate Gaussian, this, this thing, based on the approximate Gaussian elimination approach of uh, me and Sushant Sachdeva. Okay, so sparsification of Eulerian Laplacians and combine it with some existing undirected solver, but get really messy stuff, and then later simplify by just doing approximate Gaussian elimination instead. But we weren't able to get rid of needing this global sparsification of Eulerian Laplacians, which is kind of a big, ugly thing that's still left there, and this would be a nice way to clean up the algorithm to get rid of that. Okay, so we get the sense that Eulerian Laplacians are important, so let's talk more about them. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, for all directed Laplacians, say L, we have that one transpose L is zero transpose, okay? This is actually uh, very straightforward to see. It's just that it says if we look at the ith entry of this vector and this vector, it says that dii is equal, or dii minus the ith row of this thing is equal to zero. But this is just the out degree, and this is just the out degree. So of course, they're, they're equal to zero. The difference is zero. Now, what is an Eulerian Laplacian? Okay. It's a directed Laplacian L where L1 is equal to zero. So if we apply it to the all ones vector from the other side, we also get zero. What does this mean? If we look at the ith entry, it says that dii minus the ith entry of a1 is zero. This is the out degree still. But this is the integree of vertex i. All this is talk about weighted degrees. Okay, so this says that for vertex i, the out degree is equal to the in degree, and this has to hold at every vertex. Then we have an Eulerian Laplacian. Okay. Now, I want to just point out, we started learning about Eulerian Laplacians. I want to point out some nice facts about general Laplacians, back up a little bit, general directed Laplacians. If L is a directed Laplacian, so not necessarily Eulerian, and X is a diagonal matrix with positive diagonal, so just some positive entries on the diagonal, it's a diagonal matrix, then Lx is a directed Laplacian, okay? This is easy to check. Just write this is equal to dx minus ax. This is the weighted adjacency matrix of some graph with a new set of weights, and these are the corresponding weighted out degrees, so it still works. So any transformation applied to this side gives us another directed Laplacian. Now, let's talk about walk matrices. How many people have not seen the transition matrix of a directed random walk? Or would like me to talk in depth? No, you've all seen it, good. So I'll be, I'll be fast. If we take, we want a random process on vertices of a directed graph. What we're going to do is we're going to start at some vertex, then we're going to move to a random neighbor according to these edge weights. Okay, so what are the, we say we pick another neighbor with probability proportional to the weight of the edge going out of, of this vertex. The transition probabilities are just A times D inverse. 
meaning that the probability of going from uh, i vertex i to vertex j is the entry w j i. Okay. But now let's write. That notice that this has a nice connection to directed Laplacians because LD inverse in general for any directed Laplacian L is another directed Laplacian by this fact with D inverse as our x. Okay? But this is equal to I minus W. So I was able to get something that looks like identity, which I think of as a nice matrix, and W, which is a nice matrix too, and related to directed Laplacians. Okay, this is great because now we can ask all the people who thought a lot about random walk matrices. And Perron Frobenius is a cool theorem in this area. One way of stating it says that if W is the walk matrix of a uh, random walk in a uh, strongly connected uh, directed graph, digraph, then the magnitude of every eigenvalue of W is at most one. Okay, so the eigenvalues can now be complex numbers, but they are at most one in magnitude. And uh, W has exactly one uh, eigenvector, which I'll call pi. Uh, and when I say exactly one, I mean up to scaling by a number, of course, uh, with w pi, no, let me say, with eigenvalue 1. So there's exactly one eigenvector with eigenvalue 1. Uh, and pi has positive entries, provided we choose the scaling correctly. OK, so there's only one, and it has all positive entries. This is great. Now that's the end of Perron Frobenius. Let's note that if we scale pi such that sum over i pi i is equal to 1, then we can think of this as, because they're all positive numbers, as a probability distribution on the vertices of the graph. Uh, and now this equation, w pi equals pi, tells us that pi is the stable distribution of the random walk. What does this mean? It means that if we start with this random distribution of vertices, then pick a random vertex according to the random walk distribution, then we get a new distribution on random vertices. It's the same one as we started with. That's the stable distribution. So we found it, and we got told by Perron Frobenius that there's only one. Now, notice that i minus w pi is equal to 0. So pi is in the kernel of i minus w, which was a directed Laplacian. It also, it has to be the only vector up to scalings in the kernel. Because if we had any other vector, uh, then we'd get another thing with uh, eigenvalue 1 with respect to w. And we know that there aren't other ones by Perron Frobenius. OK, now let's write a diagonal matrix big pi, which is equal to just what we get by putting little pi on the diagonal. Then we can write a little pi is equal to big pi times the all ones vector. So then we can rewrite this equation as i minus w big pi all ones vector is equal to 0. OK, but i minus w big pi, i minus w is a directed Laplacian. So i minus w times big pi is another directed Laplacian by this fact. OK, 
So let me write this as L tilde, and L tilde 1 is 0. So what I've told you is that L tilde is an Eulerian Laplacian. Okay. So there's always a scaling that achieves this. And let us also just note that uh, L d inverse pi is equal to i minus w pi. So there's also a scaling d inverse pi that makes the original thing L Eulerian. OK. So we can always tra transform by a diagonal scaling into having an Eulerian Laplacian. And uh, well, that sounds good. Or maybe it's not so good. Because if I want to find x, that solves this, it's look, it looks as hard as solving a linear equation. right? So I'm trying to find x such that i minus wx is equal to 0. But it turns out, and this was the really clever point of, of the first paper in the sequence, that we can reduce the problem of finding this scaling, at least approximately, to solving a sequence of Eulerian Laplacian linear equations in slightly different matrices. So we get it like a sequence of solves in these slightly different matrices, but each time we're guaranteed that they're Eulerian. So we compile it to the sequence of easier problems. OK. Uh, whoop. Still have a few minutes, uh, at least if I get to do the counting. Um, uh, OK, so now I just want to start hand-waving a bit. So let me do a little poll. Uh, this is, I'm trying to figure out you know, at what level to talk about stuff that Michael did, for example. So how many people have heard of sure complements? Oh, it's, it's the majority. So we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about sure complements. Oh, he's shaking his head. I don't think if, if that's how, how things would work, that would be very bad for minorities. You know? <laughs> <laughs> OK, OK, yeah, so that's true. That's true. But uh, yeah, it's going to be. Uh, co conflict, I guess. We'll start with something simpler. That's what a sure complement. What? It's what you get after you eliminate a vertex. Yeah. So what does eliminate a vertex mean? It means uh, you've all seen Gaussian elimination at some point in in high school, maybe or college. Gaussian elimination eliminates a variable in a matrix, and then a variable in the like remaining matrix, and so on, and you repeat. When you're dealing with Laplacian matrices, you can think of it as also doing operations, deleting a vertex from a graph, and then getting uh, some graph on the remaining vertices. Okay? And what is this operation? Indirected Laplacians. Let's talk about it. So when I do Gaussian elimination, uh, what happens to the directed graphs? Let's say I want to eliminate a variable which corresponds to a vertex, the one in the middle. It has a bunch of incoming edges and a bunch of outgoing edges. Now I do Gaussian elimination, I get rid of this variable. And magically, what I have left, the remaining matrix, is still an Eulerian Laplacian of the remaining vertices. So what does it look like? It replaces this thing with instead a bi-clique where we get an edge from everyone who had an incoming edge to this vertex we eliminated to everyone who, had an, uh, who is being targeted by the vertex we eliminated. Okay? So we get this bi-clique. This is dense, so we're in trouble. We can end up making a very dense graph this way very quickly. So how do we make Gaussian elimination fast? We sparsify this on the fly. So we never write down this bi-clique. We write down a sparse approximation of it. This turns out to be quite challenging for directed Laplacians because in order to ensure that the output is always Eulerian, okay, the sparse approximation that we plug in must preserve exactly the degree of every vertex. But it turns out that we can do that. And we can do it efficiently. Uh, and so we preserve the degree efficiently. We also get the property that if we average over random outputs, so we're going to have a randomized way of choosing the sparse approximation, it's actually an unbiased estimator of this bi-clique that we wanted. 
So we get unbiased estimator, sparse approximation. Now we can try to say, OK, if it's unbiased uh, and it's sparse, and we repeat it many times, the errors don't add up too much, and we get Gaussian elimination. Done. Except not done at all, of course, because this only gives us an approximate inverse. Then we need to plug it together with an iterative solver to get high accuracy solutions. And we don't really have time to talk about that. But let me just you know, try to convince you that there's probably interesting things here that you should learn about. OK, so if I want to approximate things, I need ways of measuring error. OK? Normally, I would measure the error like this. Okay. I ha Even by my very generous count, I think you have one more minute or something. OK, OK. Well, I'll keep it to one minute. I'd look, and that's not that generous, but whatever. <laughs> OK, uh, so uh, we look at this norm squared between some vector that we, we have approximately that we've found and the true thing that we want. OK, and we do it in some L norm. This is the Laplacian. This is how we would normally measure error for undirected Laplacians. OK, but we don't have a PSD matrix, so what are we going to do? We still need a notion of error. We're just going to keep doing the same thing. So we're going to plug in our Eulerian Laplacian here. It's not even clear that this is a norm. But let's write it out. Let's just look at the norm of a vector x with respect to our Eulerian Laplacian. And this will be the last thing, don't worry. It's defined if I take the as square root x transpose Lx. That's just the definition. OK? But x transpose Lx can't tell that this is a, an asymmetric matrix. It's the same as doing x transpose to the average of L with its transpose, so the quadratic form with the average. Now we have a matrix here that's symmetric. Is it PSD? Yes. Because for an Eulerian Laplacian, when you average it with its transpose, you get an undirected Laplacian. So this is a valid norm. And this is the beginning of a very kind of exciting subject of doing, pretending that uh, directed Laplacians are positive semi-definite matrices, which gets complicated, but it's very beautiful. And Michael had very clean but crazy things to say about it. So ask me afterwards. Thank you. One quick question uh, to Rasmus. So can you give us a preview of one of the crazy ideas of Michael? OK, so one of the crazy ideas is that this is the arithmetic average of L with its transpose. Let's do another average, the harmonic average. OK, so let's look at L inverse plus L inverse transpose average the two, and invert. It's the harmonic symmetrization. Now, we all know that when you look at the harmonic mean of something, it's less than the arithmetic mean, right? So the same is true for matrices. No, the opposite is true for matrices. OK, so if this thing, we try to call it UL, the uh, arithmetic mean, if we write that and we call this HL, the harmonic mean, then UL is PSD less than HL. And that's just the beginning. Okay. Good. So it's interesting because uh, Michael was always on the crusade to kill any crazy guy. I guess he was hard. Except his own. That was the part of the event I didn't get. Uh,